Your word, our Lord, is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Amen. Please be seated. Earlier this week, as I was reflecting on the Old Testament passage that we just heard a few minutes ago, I got to thinking what Hollywood would do with that. And maybe because it's because I'm back in L.A. and I'm overhearing all these conversations about the business. It would have to be something in the style of Peter Jackson, you know, the guy who created the incredible Lord of the Rings trilogy. So the opening would have to be filmed from inside a helicopter. I mean, it does say that Ezekiel was transported. So imagine with me, we're coming around this massive rock face, like something in Zion National Park. And there, spreading out before us, is this desolate, windswept valley, carpeted with bleached bones. Hovering above them, we can see that they are human. Thousands of skulls and rib cages and pelvises and femurs piled and scattered all the way to the jagged mountain range far in the distance. Clearly, a horrific number of people have died here a long time ago. Their remains lie just as they fell, undisturbed except by the elements and the scavengers of the desert. It is stark and haunting and immeasurably sad. Ezekiel tells us that while in a trance, God carried him in God's hand to such a place. This vision of the Valley of Dry Bones opens the final section of the book of Ezekiel's prophecies, which many scholars believe was begun and completed during the Babylonian captivity in the 6th century BC. Apparently, Ezekiel was one of a group selected for the first deportation from Jerusalem after that city and its king, Jehoiakim, had surrendered to Nebuchadrezzar II of Babylon in 597. It was a kind of brain drain that was intended to demoralize the inhabitants of Judah, much of the upper class, the priests, professionals, and artisans were sent into exile in Babylon. Once there, Ezekiel is commissioned by God to confront his compatriots with their continuing disobedience, warn them about the dire consequences that are still to come, and offer the vision of restoration. His worst prophecies are fulfilled when about a decade later in 586 Jerusalem falls. Nebuchadnezzar's forces destroy the city, burn down the palace, loot and torch the temple, and execute or deport the remaining inhabitants. A crippling tragedy for Israel. It is the loss of their homeland, it is the destruction of the center of their identity as God's people, it is the death of all of their hopes and expectations for the future. Well, about two weeks ago, the Pew Research Center released the results of a recent poll, and some of you may have read about this, describing the changing American religious landscape. Their survey of more than 35,000 American households found that the percentage of adults age 18 and over, who describe themselves as Christians, has dropped nearly eight percentage points over seven years. Over the same period, the percentage
percentage of Americans who are religiously unaffiliated, describing themselves as atheist, agnostic, or nothing in particular, has jumped more than six points. The drop in the Christian share of the population has been driven mainly by declines among mainline Protestants and Catholics. Now, nobody has died here. No one has been rounded up and sent into exile. No city has been destroyed. No sacred texts and holy artifacts have been desecrated or burned. But in the declines that the Pew poll reveals, in the number of self-identified Christians, and in the relative importance of religious practice, certainly there are some resonances with what happened to the people of Israel in the time of Ezekiel. After all, like them, isn't the church, aren't we, a people in covenant relationship with God who have made assumptions about the shape and security of our future based on that relationship. And in this peer report, aren't we seeing evidence of the demise of our faith tradition, or at least its institutional manifestation that has ordered our world for so long that we have trusted to make sense of our lives and hold them together? Aren't we wondering whether we are if not dead, then dying. Well, at Ezekiel's vision, God doesn't take a pull. God simply leads him around the Valley of Bones so that Ezekiel can report that there were very many lying in the valley and they were very dry. God asks, can these bones live? And Ezekiel says, oh Lord, you know. So maybe that was a statement of faith. I'm guessing it was probably something more like, God only knows. Then as we heard, God commands Ezekiel to speak God's words to the bones. I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I shall lay sinews on you and cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath inside you and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. And suddenly there is this noise. Okay, surround sound in the theater. We are watching amazed as the oh-so-long-dead bones begin to bang up against each other, arranging themselves into skeletons upon which muscles form, on top of which flesh starts to fill in, and over which skin wraps seamlessly. It is decomposition in reverse. The last part of revivification requires a separate invocation of the breath. God bids Ezekiel to summon from the four winds the Ruach, that life-giving spirit that hovered over the deep at creation and that God breathed into the nostrils of Haram after forming his body out of earth. And today we are celebrating Pentecost, that great feast that we often call the birthday of the church. It's the day that we tell the story of how that same spirit was summoned by God to vivify the skeleton overlaid with sinews and wrapped in flesh that was the fragile fearful, unsure, and yet somehow hopeful body of Christ. A body that had been born out of death outside of that same city of Jerusalem, the death of Jesus of Nazareth, a Jewish rabbi who invited people into a new kingdom. That Jesus commissioned his followers to preach the good news of the reign of God to the ends of the earth. He promised that they would do greater works than he ever did, and he said that he would come back. But it's been a really long time. Long enough for you and I, 
following him 2,000 years later to begin to wonder if he really will. Long enough to wonder whether in the meantime we dry up. The whole house of Israel were convinced that they had. Our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely, they said. They were at a point of total despair. In a poem written in the 1960s called A Hard Death, Amos Wilder describes that point this way. Accept no mitigation but be instructed at the null point. The zero breathes new algebras. In other words, no trying to talk ourselves out of what we are seeing or what seems to have happened. No whistling in the dark, but rather allow this moment to teach us that when our situation seems most hopeless, in that moment lies the greatest possibility for revival. To remind us that when all is lost, there is now space for new algebras, for new ways of thinking and working, for new musculature and new flesh and new skin on this body of Christ. Now, prophesying to the Spirit is no small feat. Perhaps it is only possible to do it when, like Ezekiel, we are being held tightly in God's grip and the divine voice is whispering in our ears. And also when, as if from a distance, we can just begin to hear the rattle of bones. I heard bones rattling just this past Friday morning when out at the tiny monastic community of divine love in San Gabriel I met this young woman who is working with juvenile offenders, teaching them Shakespeare so that by the end of ten weeks they may together write and perform their own play, thereby learning to write new scripts for their lives. I heard bones rattling on Tuesday when a fifth grade girl asked me if the Holy Spirit always blasts in like in the second chapter of Acts, or is it sometimes something you just feel inside? I heard bones rattling Thursday night when a brother at Holy Spirit, which is the community where I am a, of which I am a part of the Silver Lake, he reacted to the image in the epistle of Romans of all the creation groaning in anticipation of the reign of Christ. He said, Paul drives me crazy. I am tired of labor pains. I am tired of waiting. Let's get this baby born. I hear bones rattling in the al meeting I attend, where a strange collection of actors and musicians and retired people and soccer moms share about their higher power and even occasionally mention faith communities. I hear bones rattling when Phyllis Tickle, a great spiritual master of our times who wrote about the great emergence, responds to this pupil by saying, Christianity isn't dying, it's reconfiguring. It's almost going through another adolescence, and it's going to come out a better, more mature adult. There is no question about that. Bones coming together is just the first step. New sinews have to grow over those bones. Flesh has to spread on top of that. It sounds exciting, but it also sounds like it could get pretty, well, messy. Revivification is a difficult and challenging business. The church is already recognizing that the new body may look and function very differently from the old. We are already realizing that we need more grassroots communities and fewer staggeringly beautiful buildings. We need more creativity, less dead wood, flatter organizational structures, greater responsiveness to and involvement with our contemporary culture, fewer hard and fast rules. 
And let's not forget, once the Valley of Dry Bones has been transformed to an upright army of enfleshed beings, they are still not alive. Ezekiel still needed to prophesy to the breath, to cry out, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So you and I, too, and the whole church, must invoke and invite the Lord and giver of life, the Holy Spirit that is a wild and rushing wind, to come into our valley of dry bones that may be organized just the way we like them. We need to call out, come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. We are standing here waiting for you to fill our bodies and our minds and our souls and expand us with new life in a way that is new. Send forth your spirit and we shall be created, created again, created in ways that we may not recognize. And you shall renew the face of the earth. May it be so, my sisters and brothers. May it be so. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.